you would have suffered everlasting unhappiness had it not been for this mercy. You would have never returned to life had he not shared your death. You would, not have, you would have been lost if he had not hastened to your aid. You would have perished had he not come. I'm going to read those again since you don't have it in your bulletin. You would have suffered everlasting unhappiness had it not been for this mercy. You would have never returned to life had he not shared your death. You would have been lost if he had not hastened to your aid. You would have perished had he not come. How beautiful the, word, the, the response from our Lord to those very words of St. Augustine. And it's the reality and the truth that if Christ had not taken on flesh, we would be damned. And yet St. Augustine uses a, a word in there that we're not used to hearing. You would have been an everlasting unhappiness. How interesting is that? It's kind, it kind of goes off the rails a little bit for us because we are used to sermons that talk about sin, death, and the devil, and all those things are true. They are certainly true, and I'm not taking anything away from it. I'm just telling you that it's amazing that St. Augustine left it in that if Christ had not come in the flesh, you would have no happiness. In fact, you would be dead then in your trespasses had he not taken on our flesh. We would have been lost if he had not hastened to our aid. We would have perished had he not come. And so we would think that it would go without saying that we would not be happy about any of that. But maybe we need to hear that more often. Because if we are to be unhappy, if Christ didn't come, then we have no reason to be unhappy because Christ did come. Have you ever heard a Lutheran pastor tell you, give you permission to be happy? Well, you have it. Go be happy because Christ did come for you. Christ did come take flesh. And you know what? He was in the womb of Mary. And what happened when Mary went to Elizabeth? John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb out of joy. So I'm not only giving you permission to go be happy, I'm giving you permission to go and be filled with joy. How about that? Now, I suppose I don't put it nearly as po poetically as St. Augustine or St. Ambrose of Milan or Martin Luther in our hymn for this week. But it's a good thing that I have it to read. One thing that we need to understand, we're on hymn 332. One thing that we need to understand about St. Am Ambrose of Milan and Martin Luther's translation of this hymn text is that each stanza does not stand alone. The entire hymn reads as if you would read a book. So when it starts with Savior of the Nations come, that is the first chapter. Not by human flesh and blood, that is chapter 2. Here a maid was found with child, chapter 3. Then stepped forth the Lord of all, chapter 4. God the Father was his source, 5. For you are the Father's Son, 6, from the manger newborn light, chapter 7, and then the great chapter 8, the Trinitarian text. Why is that important? Well, number one, it 
will not let us be, it, it, it keeps us from being heretics by stopping a him short of what the text actually says. Because if we stop short, then we don't have the whole story. And so regarding what I just said a little bit ago, had Christ not taken on our flesh, we would not be happy. Had Christ not entered the womb of Mary, John the Baptist would not have leapt for joy. Here, find one of my favorite stanzas of all time. Now I'll give, give you the, the before and the after here. Or I'll give you all three. Here a maid was found with child, Christ in utero, yet remained a virgin mild. In her womb, in utero, this truth was shown. Oh, I skipped it, didn't I? Savior the nations come, virgin son, make here your home. Marvel now, O heaven and earth, that the Lord chose such a birth, not by human flesh and blood, but by the Spirit of our God. Was the Word of God made flesh, <coughs> woman's offspring, pure and flesh, uh, pure and fresh. Now, I'll try to get back on track here. Here a maid was found with child, yet remained a virgin mild. In her womb this truth was shown, God was there upon his throne. And now, here's the stanza that, one of the stanzas that I love above almost, well, many stanzas. Then stepped forth the Lord of all from his pure and kingly hall. God of God, yet fully man, his heroic course began. What we have to know is that when that fourth stanza begins, that, that pure and kingly hall is not heaven. People assume that it is, but it's not. It's actually Mary's womb. So, when, when, when Ambrose and Luther say, then step forth the Lord of all from His pure and kingly hall, he's talking about Christ being born, being birthed in utero, no more. When he steps forth, he, it, it literally means that he, had, he has entered into our world from Mary's womb. So, again, then step forth the Lord of all from his pure and kingly hall. God of God, yet fully man, his heroic course began. Then what is that heroic course? If he stepped forth the Lord of all, and he did, then we have to know what his heroic course was. Well, that heroic course is the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. Christ would follow that Via Dolorosa completely and totally. In fact, once he was born, he was born to die. So where does the happiness come in? Well, Christ prayed, Lord, let this cup pass from me. If not, let it be your will and not mine. So where's the happiness in that? When Christ was nailed to the cross and He looked down and He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He could have put at the end of that, but not my will, but Thy will be done. When he looked at St. John and, and his mother and he said, Mother, behold your child. Child, behold your mother. He could have put at the end of that, Not my will, but thy will be done. And even when he yelled, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He could have put at the end of that too, not my will, but thy will is being done. And then, when he said, it is finished, those wills came together. Christ's will and his Father's will met perfectly in the sweet, bitter suffering and death of our Lord. So where is the happiness? Well, let's back up just a little bit. When Christ was born, his mother and father took him to the temple. When they took him to the temple, we find Simeon. And Simeon, when he sees the Christ child, takes him in his arms, turns to the, to the altar, and says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light to the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. What Simeon said was, you have promised, I have seen, now let me die. Because it couldn't get better. He could not be any more happy. He could not have any more joy than to behold the Christ child and to put him in his hands. And I have to reference back to communion that we had this morning. The Christ child in your hands, upon your tongue, his blood drained from the cross and given to you so that you would thirst no more. And what do we sing right after we're done communing? Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light to the revelation to the Gentiles for the glory of your people Israel. Literally, we can't get any happier. So let us return back to the cross. It is finished, says Christ. His will, His Father's will, perfectly joined. So when is it Christ's turn to be happy? He's, it, it's summed up in one word. And it's not the word that you might be thinking. It was when the women ran to the temple. And seeing that there was no one... In, in the tomb, rather. And seeing that no one was in the tomb, they bent down and looked. And then that one word didn't ring out. It was sweet. And it was like the clanging of a still small symbol. Jesus said, Mary. And in that one word, he exclaimed his happiness. Why? Because he had called his disciple by name. Mary. She turns and she says, Rabboni, teacher. And Christ told them to go and tell his disciples that Christ had risen. He had risen indeed. And so, when again is Christ happy? When is Christ joyous? When He calls you by name. Danny, Neil, Betty, Paul, Deb, Sam, Linda, Amy, Larry. Because when He calls them by name, we turn by faith, just like Mary did. 
and we see. And by faith, in, the, in that water, we are given the faith to turn to Christ and say, Rabboni, my teacher, my eyes have seen you, my tongue has beheld you, I am ready to die. I cannot be any more happy. I cannot be any more joyous. And yet Christ says also, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to my Father and your Father. And so it is that we go through this, this veil of tears, world of troubles, and yet we can be sorry. We can be happy. We can be joyous because we have seen by faith with our own eyes and we who have not clung to him in the flesh will we will cling to him in the flesh just not in this life outside of communion and that's fine because by faith we can go be happy we can go be joyous just don't forget to tell other people about that same happiness and about that same joy that you have received by faith in baptism. Lest one person never call out, Rabboni, my teacher. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.